go. We're starting to see some of the first attendees. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Scott SWCD Plant Native Prairie webinar. Hopefully, you guys are in the right place. We can get started here with introductions, at least. Um, I will start here. My name is Shelby Roberts. I am the education coordinator for the Scott SWCD. You probably might have seen my name on some of the facilitating stuff regarding this webinar. Um, I'm kind of the background of everything. I will turn it over to my coworker, Megan, who's going to be starting off this presentation. And we can go down the list here. Megan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Megan Darley. I'm the Natural Resource Specialist um, with the Soul Water District. Um, and I'll be talking about why we like prairie and why it's really good. And then I guess we can go to slide number two, maybe. Um, I'll also have Diane here if she wants to say hi really quick. Hi, I'm Diane Corbell. Uh, I do egg programs, but mostly my role in prairie is um, planning them and helping people plant them uh, for the district we do custom planting and also custom mowing so i do those as well and then um, we also have hannah here do you want to introduce yourself hi i'm hannah matthews i am a natural resource technician and i am starting to do rain gardens and kind of taking the baton for native prairie also megan do you want to lead us off with the presentation then? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we will be some of the people um, with the SWCD that can help you with helping pick out plants, how to plant prairie, um, all those steps. We have other staff too that work on it too, just so you know. And I always like to give a little blurb when we start. Um, for those that don't know maybe who the Scottsdale Water Conservation District is and what we do. Um, we work for the whole county. We're not necessarily affiliated with the county, but we work with many different entities of it, their natural resource department, the watershed districts, um, to help landowners do conservation practice on their land. Um, we do prairie, that's what you're here for tonight. We're gonna talk about that, but we also do a lot, like Diane said, with ag programs, um, conservation on ag land, um, cover crops, waterways, those types of practices, as well as lakeshore um, and urban practices like rain gardens. So this is just a small portion of what we can help you with. Um, if you have other areas of concern or on your properties and you need help with, we're a resource for all of that. So just a quick little blurb on that. So without ado, we will get started on prairie and native plants. Today we're gonna to talk a lot about native plants. And so I just wanna start with what we mean by a native plant. Um, these are plants that are from Minnesota. They've been here for hundreds of years. They've evolved to grow in our climate and all these types of conditions that we live in. Um, they're perennials, so they're going to come back and bloom every single year. They can be flowering plants, they can be grasses, they can be sedges. Um, and the main thing um, on why we use these plants in a lot of our practices and why we like prairie is they have these incredibly deep root systems that um, hold the plants in place, hold the soil in place, and are good for infiltrating water, all that good stuff. And that's what makes them really hardy too. Um, these plants can survive drought periods, they can survive flooding, wind erosion, being burned. Um, they're from Minnesota, they're native to here, so they're able to survive in our climate and they're really hardy plants. So some quick little facts will be strewed throughout this. Um, the first one is that one acre prairie can produce 12 tons of roots. And I think if you take anything away from this presentation, hopefully it is um, what's on this slide here and that is that these plants have incredible root systems. Um, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but um, on the left hand side here, these are actually in feet. So some of these roots are up to like this is compass plant here, this yellow one that's got the long roots up to 15 feet deep. Um, and what these root systems do is they burrow into the soil, they hold it in place, they add nutrients to it, they build these little canals for water to infiltrate better, they improve soil health, they're sequestering carbon for us, all kinds of great things happen with these root systems. Um, and if you notice on the, for comparison on the far left of this drawing, there's a little tiny, um, growing organism and that's our Kentucky bluegrass, which is our turf grass. And so that is what these native plants roots look into comparison with our turf grass. Um, turf grass is only about one to two inches deep. 
Um, and that's why oftentimes in the summer we have issues with it burning out, it needs to get watered, it needs to get fertilized. Um, and a lot of that has to do with these just really small, weak root systems that our turf grass has. So although it's fun to walk on a nice fresh mowed lawn, um, it's really hard to keep it that way. And I think most of us know that here. And so just a little bit more on that um, native versus non-native plants. Um, native plants are going to be a lot more low maintenance because they're from here and they're hardy, they're drought resistant, you don't need to water them, you don't need to fertilize them, um, their clippings are full of all kinds of good things that we want to go back into the soil, whereas, you know, clippings from your lawn might have um, fertilizer and pollutants that can get into our stormwater systems. And then our, our, these plants, especially prairies, and when we help you design um, seed mixes for your land, are meant to bloom throughout the entire growing season. So you'll have things blooming as early as May and all the way through September and sometimes October. Um, you're gonna have new things and new colors throughout the entire season. So those are the benefits of using native versus non-native species um, on your property. Another quick little fact, um, Minnesota contains just over 1% of its original 18 million acres of prairie. Um, and so to put that in comparison, if we lost 99% of our lakes, which is what we are most used to and know about our resources in the state, we'd have only 100 lakes left. So we've really lost a lot of prairie over the years. Um, and a lot of it's because it's been converted to ag, which is great. We need farmers, we need um, crops to eat and for food. Um, but a lot of it too has gone to turf grass, which is not so great. So we'll talk about that too. Um, so just a little history on Minnesota prairies. Um, in Minnesota, we have four different biomes. Um, we're actually a pretty unique state. Most states only have one or two. So we have a lot of diversity, which is great. Um, most people know us for our forests in Minnesota, but actually the majority of the Western part of Minnesota was originally prairie grassland. Um, and unfortunately, that's the area that we've lost the most of that ecosystem. We've lost over 90% of it um, in some areas. So we still have a lot of our coniferous and deciduous forests. We just don't have as much prairie as, as we used to. So why is it important? We, a lot of people know about pollinators and the importance of pollinators, wildlife habitat. But again, it's those root systems that really help to prevent erosion, um, improve water storage and quality, <coughs> excuse me, and then pollutant filtration and carbon production. So for any hunters in the audience, um, or just people that like to see wildlife, um, prairie is a great food source. It's great for habitat. It's good nesting cover. It provides cover all year long, unlike crops do. So it's a great place for um, these species to avoid predation. Um, it also provides conservation corridors so they can migrate safely without getting run over by a car. <laughs> <coughs> um, another great benefit of prairie is, um, of course, the, the pollinator benefit. Um, native plants provide important and critical food and habitat for our pollinators, for our bees and our butterflies. Um, without these species, we would not have the food that we eat today. Pollinators are considered keystone species, which means that they are a critical component of our ecosystem. If we lose a keystone species, it completely affects the food chain um, of, the, of the ecosystem world. So we really need to protect our pollinators. About one in three mouthfuls of food require a pollinator for us to eat. So the more pollinating, um, prairies and plants that we have, the more pollinators that we'll have to make sure that we have food to eat. So they're incredibly important. Um, some people might have heard about this, this little guy here, the rusty patch bumblebee. He was actually unfortunately just added to the endangered list in 2017 because it's been such an almost 90% decline in population. And it's one of the most critical pollinators that we have um, in Minnesota. And unfortunately, they can only forage about half a kilometer. So again, creating those conservation corridors so this guy can continue to pollinate for us is going to be huge. And um, Scott County is actually one of the highest priority areas where we need to start looking at adding more pollinator habitat um, if we want to, to save this little bee. So especially if you're in the northeastern part of the county, um, adding any kind of pollination or property will be really, really beneficial to the Rusty Patch bumblebee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Another quick fact, 
One acre of prairie can absorb seven inches of rainfall with no runoff. Um, that's pretty cr incredible considering the rain events that we've been having. Um, I think people are starting to notice that we're getting more intense rain events, we're getting higher rainfall events, um, and prairie is going to be an incredible component to making sure that <coughs> we're able to absorb the rainfall um, that lands on our, our ground. We're seeing more extreme events, um, and we're not able to always with those with regular turf grass, um, prairie will be able to help with that. And that is because of those deep root systems. Again, um, it's going to filter pollutants before entering the water bodies by drawing that water into the soil. It holds it in place. You're not getting sediment running into your lakes and streams. And again, just drawing that, all those pollutants into the groundwater table. Um, and it's really pretty. So another quick fact, um, one acre of prairie can absorb a ton of carbon in its roots and soil per year. And um, that's really important for carbon sequestering, um, which basically means that we're having less carbon in our atmosphere, um, so we have less contribution to losing that ozone layer. So the more prairie we have, the more carbon that we keep in our soil where we want it to be good for soil health. Here's just kind of a cool project that we did just to show the benefits of prairie. Um, this was <coughs> some property that's owned by Scott County Parks down in Blakely. And they were farming um, this entire area that is now green. And um, before it was converted to prairie, they were getting gullies, um, like you see on the right-hand side, every year. And this gully kind of meandered right through the middle of um, this slide here. And all that sediment was washing directly into the Minnesota River. That's the river in the back here. And so it was really steep land. It was really hard to farm. Um, it was not maybe the most um, productive land because how, how steep it was experiencing a lot of erosion. And so by just converting, this is about 18 acres of prairie. Um, this prevents every year over 168 tons of soil and just less than 30 pounds of phosphorus from entering our Minnesota River. Um, the prairie is just holding that soil in place, preventing erosion and um, also great habitat as well. So where can prairie be restored? Where can you do this um, on property that you own? Um, and the answer that's, the good answer is that um, pretty much anywhere you can try and do a little bit of prairie. <coughs> Agland is the most common place that you'll see prairie done and it's um, maybe some of the easier places because it's already ready to be planted. Um, so something that we kind of mentioned is to, to farm the best of your land and then protect the rest. So areas where you're seeing a lot of erosion, maybe steep slopes, Again, maybe it's unproductive or low yield land. Um, maybe it's kind of in a regular shape and you want to square it off. You can do buffer strips. Those are great areas to maybe incorporate just a little bit of prairie um, onto your fields. It doesn't have to be the whole ag field. There's just little smaller areas that you can do to just add some more diversity and, and good pollinator habitat. Um, you can also do lawns. Maybe you um, just built a house or you are moving out to some acreage and all of a sudden you have five, eight, ten acres of lawn and you just don't really want to be mowing this anymore. You can consider converting portions of it to prairie. <coughs> In the long run, it'll be less maintenance. You're not going to be mowing, water, watering it, fertilizing it, and it can be really um, beautiful to look out onto, see more wildlife, more habitat. So at this point, we're going to stop and take some questions, and then Diane is going to get into actually how to restore your property to prairie, the steps on doing that. So any questions that we can answer, Shelby? Yes. Feel free to type in either on the chat or in the Q&A um, any questions that you might have here, guys. Um, one question that I did see come in a little while ago was, will these slides be provided afterwards? And this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and our website after this whole thing is concluded. So all of these slides will be available after the fact, as well as all the information that we're going to be covering here. Um, one question that I see pop up here, what are the options for particularly shaded lands or shaded areas? Um, there are some species that do well um, in shadier areas, but in general, if you're talking like a prairie restoration, a lot of these plants need full full sun. Um, 
but there are some plants that you can plant in shady areas, but most of these species are needing to be like in open full sun areas. So we'd have to just come take a look at your site, maybe provide some recommendations based on that. Mm -hmm. That's a good segue to question number two that I see on here. Someone is asking, is there someone that can come out to properties and help homeowners? And yes, that is definitely a service that we provide. Um, everyone who is in attendance at this webinar right here will be receiving a post webinar survey after this is all done. And within that survey, there'll be a question where you can fill out your contact information. And from there, we can have a technician from our office come out to your property and, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, is there anything that you guys want to elaborate on that? It's kind of on a, uh, a specific, you know, case by case basis for, for that one. But yes, we yep. do come out to, to landowners properties. Yeah. And we'd recommend that. That's probably the best way to help people is to see what your land actually looks like and what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, one question here on wetlands. So someone has some wetlands. Can this be partially converted or should it stay as is? Kind of depends um, yeah. on what your wetland looks like and you know there's lots of different options. It's probably easier to tell on site um, but if you're looking at just doing a buffer I mean you can definitely do that around the majority of it or if you're looking to actually restore a wetland that's like a whole other practice and we can help with that too so mm -hmm. probably a site visit would be the best way to answer that. Right. Um, one question specific, is there anything special about planting in very narrow plots that are only about 10 feet wide in a neighborhood or boulevard areas? Um, nothing special, like different really about that other than you might have some different existing vegetation to take care of and maybe just some different maintenance concerns. Um, if you're planting in a boulevard, you might have to have some signage, let people know it's not weeds, that it's a prairie being restored. Um, you might need to do a little bit more individualized maintenance, I suppose, if it's in an urban area, you're not just gonna be able to plow it down with a big mower. So it just depends, but it's doable in, in big and small areas. Mm -hmm. uh, this question kind of ties in with that as well. For converting larger residential yards, is there a practical smallest area that you would recommend converting into prairie? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you can really do any size. Um, if It's probably easier to do, I don't know, a couple hundred square feet at the minimum just for, for ease of maintenance, but you can do just about any size. If you're doing really small, it might be better just to do a planting versus a full on prairie restoration, but mm -hmm. either is fine. Mm -hmm. Any tree species that work well in prairie areas? Um, oaks do okay. If you want to do like an oak savanna, that was one of the um, original type of ecosystems in the area was bur oaks or um, big white oaks or something with prairie underneath. But in general, um, you don't want a lot of trees near prairie because it's going to shade out your species from growing really well. Like conifers probably wouldn't do great. Um, but an oak savanna is um, a really beautiful and, and popular way to do a restoration. Mm -hmm. um, one good question here. Are our services only available for Scott County residents? Maybe. <laughs> Usually we stay within our, our, our borders and there's a storm water district in almost every other county that can help you. Um, but depending on what watershed district you're in, we might be able to help too. We can always answer questions, um, mm -hmm. but typically we're only meeting with and helping landowners with Scott County because that's where we get our funding from. So. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. I'm trying to go through some questions that people have kind of already asked and some duplicates. Um, let me see. I'm kind of keeping an eye on time here as well. We'll probably do maybe two more questions and then move on to the rest of our presentation, depending on what these questions are. Um, Someone here 
believes that they have a lot of prairie land, but there are a lot of invasive species that have been established. What is the best way to kind of control invasive species and tame those down a bit? Yeah, I think I'm actually maybe going to let Diane take that one since she'll be talking about it soon. So I don't know if you want to answer now or Mm -hmm. hop into your part. Yeah, the best way to to take care of that would be to do a prescribed burn if you're allowed. I'm not sure if it's within the city or um, if it's out in the country, but um, most places you can do a prescribed burn and that would take care of the invasives. Otherwise, you can mow it. um, As long as the natives are established, you can mow it down to the ground and uh, get everything to start from square one. Otherwise, you have to spot spray or spot mow those invasives. And then one more question here that hasn't been addressed. Can you do a prairie restoration in the bluff along a lake? Probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, if there's enough sunlight um, and there's, it depends on how steep it is, I guess. Um, again, it's, it might be something that we have to take a look at. Um, but if there's good sunlight and decent soil, um, yeah. Perfect. These are fantastic questions, guys. And for the sake of time, we'll probably move forward here, but keep the questions coming because we'll do another round of questions at the very end of the presentation for anything that we didn't get to or any new questions that have popped up. So from here, I'm going to do just a little bit of background stuff and let Diane share her screen. All right, Diane, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so, yep, I'm Diane. I am the egg program specialist and I do a lot of the plantings for the district and mowing, uh, helping people plan their prairies and getting cost share for some of them. Um, So I'm going to talk about planting a prairie. What does it take? Um, Because a lot of people just don't quite understand um, what all the steps involved. It's really not that hard. It's pretty simple. And um, I'm going to explain too what to keep an eye out for, um, what it should look like at each step of the way, year one, year two, year three, just so you're not thinking it doesn't look like it should. Because most of the time people call and want us to come out and look at it because they're concerned and it looks exactly the way it should. So um, I'll go into all of that. Okay. Okay, so the first thing you'll have to do is pick a site um, and see if your site is feasible. Like we already said, typically the best way to determine this is through a site visit, Um, but the main things that we convert to native prairie are small garden areas. You might want to take a small section of your lawn or your landscaping and convert that to native prairie plants. Um, You might want to take, you might have a huge lawn and you want to convert that so you don't have to mow anymore, Um, or you might just have some cropland. Uh, So what I'm going to do is for each of those three scenarios, I'm going to give a basic overview of what, um, how, how to convert it. And then I'll go through a couple different scenarios for each one. So first, if you want to just have a small, small garden bed and um, convert a small section, maybe it's a 10 by 10, a 5 by 5, 15 by 15. If it's lawn, you're going to have to start by killing that existing vegetation. And you can do this either with uh, laying a tarp over it for a long time to kill the grass. Um, You can rent or use a sod cutter, uh, or some people will use a herbicide to kill the grass. I'll go into these in a little more detail in the scenarios. Um, If you're gonna have a small planting in the middle of your lawn, you'll probably wanna install edging. And that's just because the the lawn and the sod will probably try and creep its way back in. Um, And if the prairie isn't established well enough at the time, it could start to take back over. So um, edging isn't 
completely necessary, but if it's a small enough planting, uh, it would probably be worth it. Um, then you'll have to purchase seeds or plants. Um, we're going to provide a list of resources after this web webinar uh, with different vendors that both see sell seed and plants, um, people who do this kind of work that you could hire, um, different plants that you can get to plant. Um, but we also, the SWCD every spring has a plant sale and seed sale um, where you could buy tailored mixes already of either seeds or plant plugs that you can plant in these small areas. And then in general, um, natives are warm season plants. So they like to be planted between May 15th and June 30th. That's the seeding window for the spring. And then um, if you're gonna just do seeds, not plants, um, you can also seed them what we call dormant seeding, which is after November 1st. So in that, in that case, the seeds would just sit in the ground um, until spring. And that actually, it sounds kind of odd, but that's the preferred method if you're gonna plant seeds and not plants is to um, do a dormant winter seeding after November 1st. So I'll give a couple of scenarios here. Um, say you have a little garden bed you want to plant this fall. So you're going to want to start killing the vegetation soon um, just to know that it's good and dead before you plant because if that sod comes back it can really compete with the natives. Uh, natives generally take a long time to get established the first year because they put their root systems down before they put above ground vegetation up. Um, so, so you want to keep out anything that would compete with the natives. Um, so if you're going to use a tarp, you probably want to start now. Um, that'll give it a good couple months of, to kill the existing sod. And then the longer you leave it, the sod will start to decompose. And um, if you've ever left a tarp or something on the ground for a couple months, it basically you pull it up and there's black dirt sometimes um, because it, it all decomposed itself. And that's actually kind of what you want for, uh, for this so that you can get good seed to soil contact. If you're gonna use a herbicide, you wanna start now also. Um, herbicides generally only take a week or 10 days to actually kill the sod, but you want to make sure that it doesn't come back and you'll have to spray it a second time because it's, it's very possible you'd have to spray it twice to get a good kill. Um, but if you have a really small area and you just want to use a sod cutter, you can just do that before the ground freezes. Um, so in a way, it's, it's a little, might be a little more work. It also might be a little simpler. Then you'll need to purchase your seeds. Um, in our resources, we're going to attach some example seed mixes but we can always help you make a custom seed mix. Um, but we'll also include seed vendors and they have plenty of different custom seed mixes for small landowners. Um, so then if you're doing a fall planting, you'll wanna wait till after November 1st, after the ground is less than 50 degrees. Um, this is because we don't want the seeds to germinate in the fall. Uh, if they did, they would just germinate and then go through a hard winter. Being a very tiny plant, they would probably die. So you you want the seed to sit in the ground when it's cold. And um, in the spring, the freeze thaw will make it fall into the ground and through the cracks, um, and then it'll germinate when it's ready and when it gets warmer in the spring. And you can seed on top of snow. It's actually kind of preferred because it helps it stick like glue to the ground. Um, so ideally you would maybe seed before a light snow or right after a light snow when you're gonna get another snow uh, or possibly even like in February when the sun is strong and there's a little snow on the ground, you can broadcast the seeds on top of the ground and then the sun will melt them into the snow and get them to stick to the ground and they'll eventually um, in the freeze thaw cycles in March just work their way into the ground and this is how it's done in nature um, that's how prairies naturally reseed themselves uh, so that's probably why it's a little more successful to do it that way and then um, the next year or next spring next summer you'll have to clip the weeds 
And if it's a small planting, you could probably just use a, a weed whip. Um, you just want to make sure you get to the weeds before they make any kind of seed so they don't keep reseeding themselves. Um, generally, lawnmowers don't go quite as high as we need, but some, some could. Um, the first year, it's okay to clip them to maybe four inches. Um, but the second year and, and above, you just want to maybe six to eight inches. You don't want to cut them that short other than the first year. So scenario two, if you're going to be planting a small, small planting next spring, um, you still need to kill that vegetation. You'll want to start with the tarp in early spring, or you could even start this fall if you don't mind seeing that bare spot there. Um, if you're going to use a herbicide next spring, you want to start, I said early May, but it depends on the spring. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is herbicides only work, or a broad spectrum herbicide like Roundup, uh, only works when the vegetation is actively growing. So if you want to kill your sod, um, you need to spray it when it's actively growing, maybe four to five inches tall. Um, so you may have one mowing or two before that, um, but never spray it right after you mow it because there won't be enough vegetation left to absorb the herbicide to kill it. And you really don't want that sod to come back in that first year because the natives would have a hard time out competing it. Um, and then two, if you want to use a sod cutter in the spring, just do it right before planting. Then you need to purchase your seeds or plants again. Um, Spring is a good time to use plants if it's a small, if it's a small planting. Um, like I said, we sell them at the district every May uh, for pickup in early June. Um, otherwise, there are some companies that sell a little packet called a Pocket Prairie. And all it is, you pick your size, like five by five or 10 by 10. And they send you a, a weed mat that you just lay on the sod to kill it. It has slits in it for each plant and it has a little edging to go around it and it has all the plants you need. So um, if you want to go that route, that's another thing you could buy to just plant right in the spring. Uh, again, the planting window is May 15th through June 30th in the spring. Um, if you have seeds, you're going to want to broadcast them and incorporate them with maybe a rake or a harrow if you have one. Um, in the fall planting, it's not important to incorporate because the freeze-thaw cycle is going to get them into the ground. But in the spring, it is important to incorporate um, partially because it can get hot and dry before you get moisture. So you don't want the seeds to germinate and then dry out. Um, so you want to get them into the ground a little bit and because they won't go through that freeze-thaw cycle to get them into the ground. And then if you do a spring planting, anytime you do a spring planting, you can add oats to prevent weeds. Um, they'll come, so the natives will take a long time to come up. You'll barely see them the first year, um, but oats can come up in just a week or two. So it'll come up, provide quick ground cover to stop erosion um, and to stop weeds from coming the first year. So then you'll just want to make sure you clip the oats and the weeds before they go to seed. So lawns are fairly similar. If, you're, if you have a big lawn and you want to convert an acre of it or something to, to prairie so you don't have to mow as much or maintain as much, um, the basics are the same. You purchase your seed, kill the existing vegetation, plant it, and clip clip the weeds. So scenario one, if you wanted to kill your lawn and do a fall planting, um, you would purchase your seed. You would kill the existing vegetation. Um, most commonly it, for lawns, if you're doing a good chunk that's um, too big to use a tarp or a sod cutter, you're going to use a herbicide in most cases. Um, if, if you're very strongly against that, you can find a way to do tillage if it's if your lawn has enough space to get some sort of tillage equipment in there. Um, tillage isn't exact, usually as effective at killing the sod. Um, you'll have to go over it multiple times. It can be done, it's just not very common because uh, it, it does take a while. Um, but if, if you wanted to do a fall planting, um, late summer you'd want to start 
with a herbicide treatment because you would possibly have to do a second one just to make sure everything's dead. Then after November 1st, um, you're gonna have to plant it. And you can do that either by renting a drill, a no-till drill from the district if you have a tractor, if it's a larger acreage um, and you have a tractor that, that's over 60 horsepower, you can pull our 10-foot drill. Um, if you don't have that means and you wanna hire the SWCD, um, we can provide that service for you either with a tractor and drill or um, we have a, a UTV and a four foot cedar. Um, generally for two acres or less, we use the UTV unless the conditions aren't um, conducive for it. We also will provide a contractor list. So if you want someone to just come and spray it and plant it all for you, um, they can do that too. And then the next summer you would again clip the weeds before they go to seed. This might be once or it might be twice um, the first year. If you're gonna do a spring lawn planting, you'd wanna get your, your seeds in early spring. Uh, generally, it only takes a couple weeks or less to order your seeds and get them in the mail. Um, most companies will ship them directly to your house. You need to kill the existing vegetation. If it's a herbicide, probably early May again. Um, depending on what kind of spring we have. And again, if you, if you want to do tillage, you might have to do it multiple times, so prepare for that. And then the planting windows, May 15th to June 30th. Um, and again, you can rent the SWC's drill or hire us, uh, have a contractor do it. And again, in the spring, you'll want to add oats for weed control. Um, might not be as big of an issue if if the sod is still there because the weeds wouldn't come up too much through the sod. But, um, and then again, clip the weeds as they come throughout the summer. So here are just a few pictures. Um, the top right is a lawn that was sprayed and um, sprayed with a herbicide. And then you can see the marks where we went through it with um, this tractor no-till drill. Um, this picture, I just have on here so you can see the tractor and drill. It's actually a cornfield, but I didn't have one where it was on the sod. Um, and then this is our UTV and four foot cedar. This was actually a road ditch that we planted. Um, it was sparsely vegetated with sod and they sprayed that to kill the sod and we planted it to natives. Then for all of you who have cropland, um, that's actually the easiest thing to convert because there's little to no site preparation needed. Uh, the main issue you'd run into is uh, if there was a herbicide used that has a lot of carryover or residual uh, effect, then that might hinder the time frame for planting natives. Um, some herbicides have uh, 18 month or 12 month rotational restrictions for maybe a broadleaf. Um, it's not super common that we run into it. it. It is becoming a little more common now that weed control is becoming an issue. Um, but it's definitely not something that, that'll stop you from planting a prairie. Um, but that is the first thing to check if you have cropland is what herbicide was used. So, cause that'll affect uh, if it gets planted the next season or if you have to skip a season. Otherwise it's the same. You need to get your seed, get it planted, and mow the weeds. Um, so if you wanted to do a fall seeding on cropland, you check what herbicide was used. If there's no restrictions on planting that fall, you would get your seed um, and we would come up with a seed plan for you. Um, you'd plant after November 1st. Um, probably with a no-till drill, which you could either rent from us if you have a tractor or you could hire us. Um, you can also do broadcast seedings in the fall. Like I said before, it's great on snow. Um, the SWCD doesn't have equipment to do this ourselves. So you would either hire a contractor or um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who we can refer you to, um, has the equipment to do it and that's their preferred method of doing it. And they have a partners program um, where we can partner between us and you and them um, so that they could help you with the seeding. So um, that's an option, a nice option if you're gonna do a winter seeding. 
and then same thing the the next summer you'll have to put the weeds if you wanted to do a spring seeding on cropland they'll need to check the herbicides used not as much of an issue because you have that whole winter um, but it still could be an issue you'd want to get your seed in the early spring and planting time is may 15th through june 30th you could do this again with the no-till drill um, you generally don't want to broadcast in a spring seeding. Um, you want to get the seed in the ground. So you could either rent or drill, hire the SWCD, or hire a contractor. And again, um, it's nice to add oats this time of year for weed control. And then same thing, clip, clip the weeds throughout the summer. Uh, so what to expect? Uh, I like to give some pictures so that people know what it should look like the first year and second year and third year because uh, that's where people have the most hesitation. These are all pictures of prairies around the county. Uh, so year one is just going to look like a bunch of weeds and that's what you sh should expect as long as you can keep them under control. So this picture in the top left was um, probably three weeks after planting. And the green rows you see are not the natives, they're the oats. Um, you won't see any of the natives in there for a while. Um, but the oats comes up quickly to get the ground covered so that minimal weeds come up. Um, oats isn't necessary, but it, it does help. Um, so then the big picture is a field right before I mowed it. Um, off in this corner, you can see there's a little patch of thistles that's just about to bloom. Um, there's some mare's tail. The rest of these are just dandelions and low growing weeds. Um, and then here's a field that I was mowing that had the oats in it. So you can tell the oats were just um, just making a green seed head but weren't, weren't going to seed. Didn't have viable seed yet. There's a bunch of weeds uh, within it but not, not fully covered with weeds because, because the oats was there to shade the ground. But by year two, it already looks like a prairie. Uh, these are all three are year two prairies from around the county. Um, you can see in this picture that there's some mare's tail, which is an annual weed. Um, they'll probably want to mow that, but it's not, uh, it's not a big issue. The main concern is um, keeping thistles out. So you want to watch very di diligently for thistles and either um, spot clip or spot spray them. Uh, year two, you might have to do one mowing. Um, like this, I might mow once. Um, these, I wouldn't. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's some diversity, but it's not completely filled in. Um, and also, the black-eyed Susans are one of the first things to bloom and take off. So the first few years, you'll, it might seem dominated by black-eyed Susans if that's in your mix. Um, but throughout time, they wane a little bit. Um, and generally, throughout time, grasses become more dominant than flowers. Um, it does help if you burn it, um, then it kind of sets it all back to square one and they come back equally. But um, generally, that's what you're going to see is more flowers in the beginning. And then years three plus, it really takes off. Um, you probably won't have to mow other than spot mowing, sp spot spraying. Um, it should fill in really well to where it's um, thick um, and should have a lot of nice diversity in color. So here are some more prairies from Scott County. Uh, as you can see, this was a crop field that was eroding. This is the first, the, after the first clipping. Um, so it just looks like a green field of clipped weeds. And then by year three already, it was filled in and looking good. Here's another scenario. Uh, it was cropland. Then the more sparse picture is year two. And the big picture here is year five. So maintenance, um, all prairies are going to require a little bit of maintenance. 
generally the first year and a small amount the second year. Um, and then it's minimal after that, but um, don't think that they're not gonna require anything. Um, so the first year, you'll probably have to mow it once for sure. Well, you'll have to mow it for sure once, possibly two times, depending on how early it gets planted and how weedy it gets. Um, any, you want to mow it before the weeds go to seed. The first year, you can mow it fairly short, four to six inches tall. Um, and then for small, small garden plantings, uh, you can use a weed whip. If your lawnmower goes four inches high, you could do that too um, the first year. And then for larger plantings, you want to use a bat wing or flail mower. Uh, you don't want to use like a hay vine or anything that's going to windrow it where it would leave a bunch of residue in one spot to kill out the vegetation under it. And you can hire the SWCD. Um, that's a picture of our tractor and mower right there. Um, we, we do do custom mowing. Years two plus, um, so you might need to mow one more time in year two if there's a lot of weeds. Um, then you want to mow it six to eight inches tall just to clip off the top of those weeds so they don't go to seed, but you don't want to really damage the natives. And you might need to spot mow or spot spray, especially those thistles. Every four or five years, you'll be encouraged to do a prescribed burn. And we don't do that, but we have a list of contractors we'll give you that can do that for you. Burning it um, really rejuvenates it because natives um, have really deep root systems and cool season and non-natives don't. So when you burn it, it'll get rid of those undesirable species and um, rejuvenate the natives. It'll also get rid of scrubby trees and shrubs that you might not want in there. Um, you can also mow it to the ground um, as maintenance, but just every four or five years. Probably better to burn, but that's another option. So I'll talk about uh, the programs that we have available for cost share. Um, in the lawn scenario, we can offer $500 per acre incentive, which is just a one-time uh, one -time payment. There is a minimum of a half an acre. So say you had one acre of lawn you wanted to convert, um, then it would be a $500 one-time payment. And that covers um, quite a few of the expenses to, to spray it, to plant it, to buy the seed. Um, and that's, that's kind of what it's meant for, to help cover some of those expenses. If you have small acreage cropland that's between a half acre and two acres, is also that $500 per acre one-time payment, again, to cover some of those expenses. And um, anytime any of these cost share options um, require a 10-year agreement saying that you're going to leave the prairie in and maintain it, clipping the weeds and keep it under control for 10 years. Um, if you have cropland that's over two acres that you want to convert, we have a, a rental rate program. And um, if you want to know a, an exact price, um, you can give us your field, your acreage, and we can give you a quote. Um, but generally, it's between 160 and 186 per acre per year, and that's a 10-year agreement. So, for example, uh, if it were 160, be 160 times however many acres you have times 10 years. Um, with that, we also, with larger acreages like that converting cropland, we also uh, reimburse you for 50% of your expenses, which is seed, planting, uh, one mowing. Um, so we can help with that too. Um, but for any Scott County landowner, it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to sign up for any cost share system. For this, um, we can provide a free site visit, free planning assistance. We can make you a seed plan or help you decide what species you want in it. Uh, we can give you lists of resources for where to get things, who to hire. Um, we can make a cost estimate of what we think it'll cost you based on uh, how many acres you have, because costs really vary depending on um, what size of a project it is. 
Um, for example, uh, if you're going to have somebody out to spray two acres of lawn or a quarter acre of lawn, it, it might cost similar because there's a, a drop charge. Um, so, so costs can really vary. We can't say it's so much per acre for every project. It, it really varies. Um, we can give you maintenance advice if you don't know if you should mow it or burn it or if the right plants are coming up. We get those questions a lot. Um, and then we can also provide services like planting it for you or mowing it. That's with our equipment. I guess we don't, uh, for small plots, we don't come out and tear your sod out and plant it for you. But um, for larger acreages or lawns, we can provide those equipment services. So if you want to get started, um, the first way to do that, Shelby is attaching a form to the survey. And it's a contact form, so it'll automatically place a request. And um, one of the us technicians will get it and give you a call to sign up for a site visit. If you don't do that, um, you can either call our office at the number provided or, um, or email us. And with that, I'll open it up to questions for any of the presentations. Yes, thank you both. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Diane. Fantastic presentations. And there were a couple questions that we're coming up throughout your talk, Diane. Um, one question here, when do you burn or cut prairies after they've already been established for four to five years? Like what time of year? Um, uh, not specifically in that question. I mean, if there is a specific time of year, then yes, or you know, just what maintenance is needed on a four to five year old prairie. Yeah, so four to five years is generally when you do the burn. They like to do them in the early spring when the, the natives are still brown, but the everything, the ground and stuff is wet. Um, and then after the four to five year burn, it's generally like spot spray or spot clip as needed. And then every four or five years after that probably is a good time to burn. So the burning is more like every four or five years. Um, it's not required through our cost share or anything, but it, it's just a nice way to uh, rejuvenate it. Mm -hmm. um, a couple questions here about planting on slopes or pieces of land that, um, you know, happen on angles, anywhere between 20 to 30 degree angles or just what kind of extra steps are needed for those types of sites. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it depends how large the area is. If it's um, like a road ditch, um, it's probably important to keep it covered. So um, if you're not against using a herbicide to kill it, you would, you would kill it with a herbicide so that the sod stays in place, the dead sod, and then you, we, would, um, we, can, we can seed most road ditches um, with our equipment our little four foot seeder and UTV. Um, if it's too steep to drive something on, um, you'll probably have to do a hand planting and just make sure if you do remove the sod, um, maybe sprinkle some straw over it to keep, keep it from washing um, or else, mm. you know, find a way to leave some residue there. Or maybe even erosion control blanket if it's like really steep. Um. That's an option too, just to make it expensive if it's a big area, but yeah, you could try that. Okay. Um, how long are wildflower seeds good for after being purchased? Are they good for months? Are they good for years after? What, what happens to the viability? Yeah, it really depends on where you keep them. If they're kept in a cool, dry place, um, they should be fine, but generally we say like every year you keep them, you cut the germination in half. That's probably uh, a little more strict than you need to be, but that's the rule of thumb we go by. Um, so that they can stay good for a long time, but trying to predict what they're like is very difficult. You can, um, if you have some really old seeds, you could do a paper towel germination test, um, but yeah, it's really hard to predict. Generally, the longer you keep them, the less viable they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, one question specifically about uh, CRP. Uh, what are the native prairie requirements for CRP acres? Um, as, as far as how many acres or? Uh, the question doesn't specify. We might need a little bit more detail to answer that one. Yeah. So we do, as far as like uh, seeding plan, we follow the NRCS recommendations for our seed plans. So um, they would be similar in that respect. Um, as far as dollars, um, we have our own system for um, determining how much per acre you're gonna get. Um, and so CRP would be different in that respect too. Um, Otherwise, the principle is the same between the two. Okay. Diane, I think you covered this one a little bit, but there was a question about how to promote more wildflowers rather than grasses in prairies. Um, any other comments that you would have on that? Any other advice that you can give? Um, Good seed mix would be one. I mean, you can pick seed mixes that have more flowers and forbs or more grasses. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for more flowers, if you're not seeing a lot of flowers in your prairie, um, you might need to do some burning. Burning usually tends to bring the flowers back. That's why we recommend it. They usually pop with a lot of color right away. Um, you can interseed too into your prairie if you're not seeing a lot of flowers you can try seeding some more in the spring or in the fall to try and encourage that growth so it's possible mm -hmm. and one other question here about planning assistance um do we offer planning assistance and seed plans for smaller gardens or is that just for larger pieces of land oh, that's that's for anybody. Um, we can help you. Yep, we can do a site visit, uh, help you figure out what would be the best thing to plant and where and seed plan and even uh, we can generally do cost estimates for small things like that, but might not be necessary. Um, so yeah, we can help with any size. Yeah, even if you don't qualify for the minimum for the CASHA program, we can still help with everything else. So. And one thing I didn't mention um, for those small garden plantings, um, if, you, if you're looking to get natives uh, in a small area and you don't have a rain garden, that's, that's a nice place where you can um, do both. You can have a little planting, but it'll also capture water and, um, and filter the water. So, and we do have a cost share program for that. So that might be a, a better option for those small plantings um, if you don't already have one. I think from my end here, I'm caught up on all the questions that I see both in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, well, I'll give maybe a couple more minutes to see if there's anybody else that has anything on there. But for now, I'll just plug one more time that if you are in attendance to this webinar here, you should be receiving an email from me probably early next week with a link to a survey that you can take which will include that contact form that both Megan and Diane were talking about, where you can fill that out if you have any additional questions that we can help answer for you, or if you would like a site visit, that's where you would fill out your information and we can get in contact from you from there. So you can use either the information that's on the screen right now to get a hold of us, or keep an eye out for that survey. And I don't think I see any other new questions that have come about yet. Again, this webinar is being recorded and it will be up on our website and our YouTube page soon. So you'll be able to reference all this information in there and uh, ask us any other questions that you might have. So I think with that, I will probably end this webinar here. So thank you everybody who came and listened to us. Thank you to Megan and Diane and Hannah for all being here and for giving their presentations. They're a wealth of knowledge. So any questions you guys have, feel free to, to bring it on over, okay? 
And final sign off, anything else to say, Megan or Diane? Thanks for listening to us <laughs> on this beautiful night. So thanks for tuning in and spending yeah. your Thursday night on a webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Oh, I'm getting some nice thank yous from the chat too. Thank you guys for being here.